Good evening. I'm Noah Sobey, President-Elect of CIS, and it's an honor to be here to introduce Mark Bray, uh, who will be shortly delivering uh, the Society's presidential address. Mark is a UK national, spent his early career as a teacher in Kenya and Nigeria, he later work, worked in Papua New Guinea with the University of Papua New Guinea and the Ministry of Education there. Then, briefly, he was back at the Institute of Education in London, and then moved to Hong Kong in 1986, where he's been, with the exception of time out as the director of UNESCO's IIEP from 2006 to 2010, and he's now back in Hong Kong. I find it uh, fascinating, amazing that this is Mark's third presidency of a comparative and international education organization. Uh, he was president of the Comparative Education Society of Hong Kong, 1998 to 2000. Then he was president of the World Councils, 2004 to 2007. Uh, and he has been president of CIES this past year. And we wonder, of course, what's next? We, however, get to hear Mark deliver an address titled Schooling and its Supplements, Changing Global Patterns and Implications for Comparative Education. Please join me in welcoming President Mark Bray. Thank you indeed, Noah, and thank you colleagues for coming this evening, day two of our conference, and a very special day for me, as you can imagine. Preparing for this address, one naturally begins by reading the texts of the predecessors of previous presidents of the society. And one of the great traditions is that we put them in the Comparative Education Review so we can find them. One of the aspects of those traditions is that one is permitted to be a little autobiographical. So Noah, that's quite a helpful summary of my professional biography. And you will see some of the strands in what I'm saying as I go along. It comes at a period of my own career, towards the end of the career. So you ask Noah what I might be doing next after being president of CIS. What I'm planning to do next is about 24 hours from now, hand over to you. So that, I think, would be a good thing to do next. Now, here we are in this conference, and we know by now this logo pretty well. And I'm going to be pretty well behaved in addressing the theme of the conference. I thought it was a very well chosen theme and it fits well with the sorts of things I would like to say. So again, thank you, Noah, for choosing a theme which is relevant to so many of us. And within that, you chose six sub-themes. I'm going to be extremely ambitious and skate through all six vis-a-vis -vis my topic. But as I've mentioned, I am going to personalize it to some extent. And you have mentioned that I was a teacher first in Kenya and then in Nigeria. In the 1970s, my master's degree was in African studies. I was passionate about Africa. And much of the early decades of my career, like many of us in this room, have been concerned with the organization, the expansion of schooling, and in my case, with educational planning. And you have mentioned UNESCO's IIEP, the Institute of Educational Planning. So indeed, my PhD thesis focused on Nigeria, and somewhere in this room is Kenneth King. Kenneth, where are you? Over there, amazingly, is my PhD supervisor, who doesn't look much older than he did then. I may do, or whatever. 
Kenneth, I had the privilege of being your first PhD student, I believe. Not necessarily the best, but the first. <laughs> and it's an honor to me that you are here in this room as I deliver this address. So that is the book which emerged from my thesis about universalization of primary education, very much to do with schooling in one of the states of Nigeria. During that decade, I was very much focused on Africa. Here's one of the broader books that I focused on, published in 1985. And from there, as Noah has mentioned, I moved to Papua New Guinea. Among writings at that time was a book about decentralization, planning mostly of the formal system of education. That led itself to work on small states in the South Pacific, the Caribbean, and other parts of the world. And alongside, but subsequently, work on costs and financing. And you will see the relevance of that in a moment. Uh, my first degree was in economics before African studies and then uh, education PhD. And there is a 1985 book about community financing book, 1988 Community Financing of Education. Uh, and I put on the screen here a 1996 book called Counting the Full Cost, Parental and Community Financing of Education in East Asia. Now, I'm bringing all this because it explains what follows. That book that I've just flashed up, some of you know Sheldon Schaefer. Sheldon was at the time the regional advisor for education in Asia for UNICEF. Later he moved to UNESCO, but he was in UNICEF at that time. Sheldon was worried about household costs in East Asia. And so he asked me to find out what I could about household costs. And we looked at three groups of countries in East Asia. Three times three equals nine. Three were long-standing capitalist countries. Three were still socialist countries. Three were converted from socialism to capitalism. The long-standing capitalist countries Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand, still socialist, the People's Republic of China, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, and the socialist to capitalist, Mongolia, Myanmar, Cambodia. Now that bar chart, in pretty simplified form, shows the balance of government and household financing of education, primary education, in those countries. And what to me and to Sheldon Schaefer and to other colleagues, uh, the book was published by the World Bank in collaboration with UNICEF, but the most striking, the dark colored shows household expenditures, the blue one, the lighter one, government expenditures. The most striking is Cambodia, where here was a country which pretended to have free education, but the reality was that households were meeting a huge proportion of the total costs of education, something like 78%. And what were they? Well, they were uniforms and books and snacks and bicycle fees and bribes to the teachers and private tutoring, a huge amount of private tutoring as a normal tradition of daily life. Well, that required some further investigation and so that was followed up by a book in 1999, the title of which was The Private Costs of Public Schooling household and community financing of primary education in Cambodia. 
published later by IIEP, again with UNICEF. So that's setting the stage for what I'm really going to be talking about this evening, which is, on the one hand, we've got schooling. On the other hand, we've got a huge amount of supplementary tutoring of various kinds, which turned up in the data in the 1990s in East Asia, but has now become a global phenomenon. I indeed followed that up with a booklet in IIEP's series, Fundamentals of Educational Planning. And at that stage, I was using the metaphor of shadow education. In the academic literature, Stevenson and Baker used that in their article in 1992. Uh, in the more the newspaper literature, I found a reference to it in Singapore in a newspaper in 1991. It's also in a Malaysian report in 1992. I thought it was a fairly useful metaphor, at least to describe what was happening in Cambodia and a few other places. How did I define it? Well, I was looking at private tutoring, that is academic, fee charging, and additional to the provision of mainstream schooling. And so there were the Cambodian teachers who would teach their lessons in the government school during the school hours, but would then teach supplementary lessons, often to the same children, often in exactly the same classrooms. And it was a shadow insofar as the supplementary tutoring mimicked the curriculum of the government school. As the government school curriculum changed, so the shadow changed. I looked around, I found a great deal of this in other countries as well. Now in that 1999 book, here were some of the examples. It was especially strong in East Asia and South Asia and Japan is one of the places that is very famous for this. There are figures on Juku attendance, the private institutes, showing how for elementary and for lower secondary, very high in lower secondary and growing over the decades. That was a graph in the 1999 book. In the Republic of Korea, they are even more famous for this. In fact, I would say that they are the world champions for what are called hagwon and institutionalized forms of supplementary education. There were figures from Seoul in 1997, uh, about 78% of elementary students receiving it. And with huge expenditures from households, approximating the same amount of money that the government was putting into things. This is really big news, uh, but not usually captured in the UNESCO statistics and elsewhere. This is the sort of reason why Sheldon Schaefer wanted to look at this. Singapore that I've mentioned, that was one of the articles that used this metaphor, a 1992 article uh, there showing 29% of primary students and 30% of secondary students. Well, in 1999, that book was the first global study of this phenomenon. It made some impression. Uh, it was translated into a number of languages, but I revisited the topic 10 years later and found that the phenomenon had greatly expanded and had indeed become a global phenomenon. The first book, was translated into five languages, the original in English plus uh, five equals six. That was already pleasing to me. The second book went into a total of 20 languages. And that itself was an indication of people wanting to know about this phenomenon. The 1999 book, one of the reactions was, well, that's interesting, Mark, but that's you people over there. That's Japan, that's Hong Kong, that's uh, Korea, that's Singapore, that's not us. The book did have data from Mauritius, from Egypt, from various other places, Kuwait,
but uh, it's true that it was dominated by East Asia. Ten years later, people were saying, this is us, and the reason for all of these translations, the main reason is people were saying, wow, we didn't know that this was a phenomenon elsewhere. We thought it was only us that had this issue. So that's an indication of the global spread, which has continued, and part of my message is it should be an agenda for us going forward. Now, what am I talking about here? Part of the challenge is diversity in formats. Schools, we basically know what schools are. Of course, they vary in their architecture, in the design, in the operation. We know what they are, however. I'm looking here at a diversity of forms. A lot of tutoring is one-to-one. -one. Some of it may be in small groups. There are others in large classes. This is a class in Bangkok. Uh, and some is increasingly by internet. I don't precisely know who that young lady is, but she might easily be somebody in the United Kingdom studying maths taught by an Indian. There are companies in India using the internet to tutor children in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere. So it is becoming a global phenomenon in multiple ways. It becomes a challenge of classification, as I will talk about. But who's providing it? Well, uh, university and secondary students are tutoring younger people. We have professional tutors working as individuals. Companies are all over the place. There are small companies with shop fronts. There are big multinationals like Kumon. Do you know Kumon? Every time I see that, I look at that face. What do you think about that face? It doesn't look to me like a happy face. Do you think it's a happy face? Um, Kumon say it's a determined face. <laughs> that's their message. We've got to be determined. Well, that's itself symbolic of what we are doing in the shadow education industry. And then, in addition, we've got community bodies of various sorts. That, this happens to be Mandaki from Singapore. Now, you're aware that I am living for several decades in Hong Kong, as Noah has said. I want to say a bit more about Hong Kong so that you can see one face of the phenomenon. And in Hong Kong, we have taken this phenomenon to a really special stage. So here are star tutors being advertised in Hong Kong. They have their faces on the trams and the buses, and they adopt cool poses. Uh, they call themselves things like the godfather of science and brand a tutor and queen of English. Can you imagine school teachers saying, I am the queen of English? <laughs> These people are aggressive and they have very demanding advertisements. This is powerful stuff in Hong Kong. This is Nathan Road, which is our big street. Uh, Look at this lady. Wouldn't you like to be taught English by her? <laughs> These are advertisements catering for young people with a completely different image from the schools, and deliberately so. Uh, this man we might want to recruit for CIES. <laughs> and just one more here to fit our theme of equity. Basically, the story is that the people upstairs are paying for the lifestyles of the people downstairs. So we can think about what's going on here, what are the prices, who is paying for the flashy lifestyles of these tutors. Now, that's Hong Kong where it's especially obvious, but it's not just Hong Kong. There are big companies around the world. So now I'm going to Taiwan, and for the sake of possible isomorphism, here is Turkey. Uh, same sort of thing in two completely different locations. Big companies, smaller companies like I've just had. Here is 
the pillar in Bangkok in the subway system, the, uh, what they call the SkyTrain, uh, advertising on the platforms. By contrast, here is Canada, it's Vancouver. So what am I saying? It's happening all over the place in North America as well. And this one I choose because it also offers try all you can, can study at $360 a month. So this is like those restaurants where eat everything you can for a fixed price. What is that telling us? It's certainly talking about the commodification of education, that this is something uh, that is being packaged and uh, it's an unusual approach to me. Going further around the world, there are lots of lamp posts and trees around the place. Mauritius and France I chose. And then this one in Malta, well, you can either go to the beach if you look at the top or you can go to private tutoring in English down below. I think I know which one I will choose. From there, we go to teachers as tutors. Uh, this picture uh, from England is actually taken from the Guardian newspaper, so there is commentary in the Guardian. Uh, evidently, the implication is this teacher is giving part-time tutoring. There is quite a lot of it in England, not very well documented. Or, back to Cambodia, is this a public class or a private class? It's hard to see because the private tutoring in Cambodia commonly is same teacher, same students, same classroom. So what I'm saying here is in content, some of it is a shadow absolutely copying, some of it is elaboration. It's expanding the regular curriculum and going beyond what is taught in the classroom. Then the question is, all right, if it's a shadow or an elaboration, what is it shadowing? What is it elaborating? And here I am going back to our field and earlier writings, and I was glad to meet Chiki Ramirez just now. And Chiki, are you here? Uh, Chiki was writing with John Bowley and John Meyer, 1985, over 30 years ago, about the prevalence of mass education in our comparative education review. And at that time, saying, UNESCO ent estimates about 75% of children are in something called a school. Well, that was written in the context of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UNESCO conferences of the 1960s, which had a very big effect on that. Since that was written by the team in CER. We have had the EFA movement launched in Jom Thien, Thailand in 1990, reiterated in 2000, reiterated again in 2015. And earlier today, I was in this room for a session about the Global Education Monitoring Report, the GEM report. So here are updated statistics. John Bowley and uh, Chiki Ramirez and John Meyer were saying 75%. Now we're told it's 105% because of overage and underage children in school. And secondary is up to 75%. So we are talking about mass expansion of education, which indeed for our CIES conference was a theme for the Toronto conference, uh, Karen Mundy organize that, and we have discussed it a lot in CIES conferences appropriately. David Baker similarly put that statement into his presidential address. And what David was talking about was the impact of this massive regime of education on our societies, how it has transformed most individuals and created far-reaching consequences. Well, I want us to look at that and 
Back to our conference theme of the promise of comparative education, I'm going to suggest an elaboration of the agenda. Yes, schooling, mass schooling, and we are increasingly seeing mass supplementary education, shadow and other forms of supplementary education. And that has an impact on what's going on. So, as a result of the expanded schooling, various things happen. First, when everybody goes to school, competition increases. And related to that, post-compulsory education is now within reach for people for whom it would have been out of reach. They wouldn't have considered it. I know people of my generation and previous generations who simply said, in our family, we don't go to university. They don't bother. That's for other families. The success of the EFA movement, of these expanded enrollments, is that it becomes within reach. But then families have to find other ways to differentiate themselves. So what else changes? Private actors make themselves available with supplementary services because the market has expanded. You've got more people going to school. You've got more competition. And while UNESCO and other well-meaning bodies talk about equity, families are on the whole not interested in equity. Families are interested in being better than other families in the competition for the jobs and the other things. So the EFA movement has provided great fuel for the private entrepreneurs who are very grateful for it and an expansion of the supplementary section. Now, again, earlier today, Antonio Novoa was talking about dataism, the new religion, he said. And Antonio, you talked of the IEA 1967 established and the celebration of numbers. And you then, in a breath, mentioned PISA. PISA data, there are 2012 data. Uh, what you can see there are out of school classes, the red line, organized by a commercial company and paid for by parents. The blue line, any personal tutoring, paid or unpaid. Now, here, I want just to say, be careful with these data. Nutsa uh, Kobachidze, who's sitting in the front row there, she and I wrote an article in the Comparative Education Review saying, especially for this topic of supplementary education, the questions asked in PISA are extremely problematic. Just the questions in English are problematic. By the time they've been translated into other languages, they are even more problematic. And indeed, my own conclusion is that, especially for some of the earlier iterations of the PISA questionnaires, the best thing to do is to put them in the garbage. They are highly problematic. Now, even these ones, frankly, are also problematic. Here they have been ranked by the blue line. So the blue line at the top, you will see at the top Greece, that's possible. Greece has had a long tradition of front hysteria and of tutoring of different types. Thailand, a bit surprising. Russia, a bit surprising. But Turkey, yes. Um, the ones at the top, OK. But frankly, when I find Japan at the bottom, I have a big question about these PISA data. And I would like some help there to find out what was actually asked in Japanese to the students and how it was administered. Because I think we really have to be quite careful. Hong Kong, I definitely know a lot about. Uh, those Hong Kong numbers, I'm going to elaborate on what I think they might be. PISA, as you know, is 15-year-old children. It's a pity to me that the blue line is a mix of paid or unpaid. Unpaid could be just teachers doing their jobs. I'm less interested in that than the paid part of families getting supplementary education for a fee. But with a team, we have looked at Hong Kong data with a reasonably similar sample to the PISA data. We have higher numbers. Uh, you can see them there, 51.4% of grade nine students 
had received tutoring within the previous 12 months, and by grade 12, 71.8. Now again, these numbers are quite useful because they show the market dynamics. Once you get to 71.8, the 28.2 are in a minority. And if you're in the minority, you actually get carried along by the tide. You feel insecure. To some extent, the supplementary industry is an insecurity industry. The tutoring companies will talk to parents and they will say, your daughter is only 16 once in her life. You have a duty as a parent to help her out. The parents are nervous, the students are nervous. We found out about subjects, English, very popular, mathematics, very popular. No surprise, because those are also the keys to other topics. But even liberal studies, which in Hong Kong was a new subject, it's supposed to be a subject which can't be tutored, but it is tutored by these mass tutoring companies. So even for a subject like liberal studies, which is supposed to be creative and so on, uh, there were 13.4% of our sample. Well, from there, the question is, do the students think it works, the students and the families? Well, yes, they do think it works. These are the students' responses. Uh, anything above 2.5, the mean, is positive. So they do think it improves their examination grades, uh, confidence in examinations, confidence in school performance, and so on. I would expect them to say that, it, that they think it works because they're paying for it. But then the question, does it really work? Well, the answer, it depends. This is a domain where we need quite a lot more research on how much the tutoring does work and for whom. It depends strongly on the quality and skills of the tutor, the motivation, the receptiveness of the student, the match between the tutoring and the school curriculum, and the ways to manage the scarce hours. There's a lot happening in that slide and in the bullet points of those, that slide. Taking the last one. <coughs> There's a picture of a Hong Kong classroom. <coughs> and my question is, is this cause or is this effect? <coughs> One reason why this student may be falling asleep in the classroom is because he was tutoring late at night. And when you're tutoring late at night, you've got to find a time to sleep. And maybe the best time to sleep is in the school classroom. And indeed, we do know that many of our students take the tutoring more seriously than the schooling. They take it more seriously because they're paying for it and the schooling is free, and they take it more seriously because they can choose their tutors. You do not choose your school teachers on the whole. You're stuck with whoever is assigned to your class. So there are some quite important dynamics going on here. At what cost? Well, in our sample, 35% felt it was a burden to their families, and also a cost of leisure time. So, back to our theme. Noah, thank you for giving us six sub-themes. I'm trying to be a good student and following them through. Your first one was about problematizing teaching and learning. And what I'm going to suggest is that the quality of this supplementary education is even more variable than the quality of schooling. We know we have good schools and bad schools, good teachers and bad teachers, good classes, bad classes. The spectrum in the supplementary education sector is even wider. We have got university students who have no training. We've even got secondary students who have no training giving supplementary education. So the quality is very wide and hard to measure. We also know that there is a backwash on schooling. That Increasingly, teachers are assuming that students receive tutoring, and the teachers then put in less effort, and indeed then the students have to go to tutoring because they don't get the full curriculum if they don't. So again, this is a topic which 
has a big backwash on schooling, and it can take away talented and dynamic teachers to work in the shadow sector. Noah, your second one was problematizing development and innovation. Well, some of this is highly innovative because it is market-driven, and schools are staid and old-fashioned. But other provision is just mimicking, and as I've just said, some of it is just by amateurs. When it's mimicking, it may be more of the same, a child that's failing in the first place because the curriculum doesn't fit the child or is boring, just gets more of the same, and that's not necessarily inspiring. North-South, one of the big issues that has also been covered in this room today is who sets agendas for studies? Any academic study, including our own field here. The agendas tend to be set by North America and Western Europe, and as a result of that, we do not see as much research in this theme as we should, in my opinion. So there is research in this country and elsewhere on education for enrichment, but I would say that shadow education, because it has been less common in Western countries, has lagged in research. And I would also say that many faculties, colleges of education are in effect colleges of schooling more than colleges of education. They may have other domains, but what I'm talking about is inadequate in this. I would also say the same thing about ministries of education. Many ministries of education are ministries of schooling. And certainly in Hong Kong, our education bureau prefers not to know. Please don't talk about that, Professor Bray. It's embarrassing. Let me tell you how good our schools are. Around the world, though, I would say that patterns in Asia may have implications or even do have implications. What is happening in Asia is now flowing into other parts of the world, in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, and elsewhere. So in terms of North-South, to some extent, we can say this has come from Asia, but also Greece, uh, Egypt, and elsewhere, and is flowing into the richer countries where it was less evident. Data evidence and performativity, it is extremely hard to collect data on this phenomenon. Uh, it needs special approaches because the tutors may not want to tell you, the families may not want to tell you, the, uh, the children may not want to tell you, but there are ways around that, and uh, I want to encourage more of them. But in terms then of separating the impact from of supplementation from regular schooling, again, that's hard, and I would like to see much more work on it. But for performativity, tutors tend to be driven by profit as well as for education or indeed instead of for education. Inclusion, exclusion, well, it's fairly obvious that low-income families cannot afford the same amount or same types. Some low-income families are somehow scraping the money together but others are simply left out of the race even before they begin. So there is a challenge in that domain. One response has been to give subsidies, but I would problematize that by saying that No Child Left Behind, various other schemes around the world, in effect are saying that schooling is not enough and that everybody should have some sort of supplementation. Now, I have a problem with that. And the sixth one that you gave to us, uh, Noah, was about problematizing neoliberalism and the market. Well, first we have got governments who may be ambivalent about the role of the market. Some are, some aren't. But uh, the, the question is about education as a public good, but also as a private good. Some governments do work hard to equalize education systems, 
With my colleague Zhang Wei, who's sitting there, we have done work in Shanghai, uh, where the Shanghai government has worked hard to equalize the school systems by forbidding tracking, for forbidding entrance examinations, by putting good teachers spread around the municipality, by mentoring schools so that the low-performing schools become as good as the high-performing schools. A lot of work put in by the Shanghai government and similarities can be found elsewhere. But what happens in these cases? Well, the government works hard to equalize and markets work hard to unequalize them again. The parents may not be so interested in equality. Parents want to be better than other families. And the tutoring companies say, thank you very much. Let me help you to unequalize the education systems that the government is working so hard to promote. Which, to me, ends up being a little bit like this. Do you know these dolls? You press them down, and then they bounce up again. We work hard to equalize the education system, but somehow it unequalizes itself again. So in Shanghai or elsewhere, the governments find ways to make schools and classrooms similar, but the supplementary education is a major tool for unequalizing the system again. So what does all of this mean? We can show there is a global expansion of supplementary education, some shadow, some non-shadow, some enrichment of various sorts. An agenda that I would like to encourage colleagues to work on needs to look at the big picture, and I'm going to build up a picture, a diagram, to show some of the things that I would like to focus on. We have got, beginning from the left, a global environment that has changed is changing. Globalization as a phenomenon, outsourcing by click from India, the tutoring in mathematics to the United Kingdom or anywhere else. We have made great progress in mass education, the EFA agenda, UNESCO and SDG inspired work. We've got economic and social development across the globe which itself links to issues of class structure and the labor market. The middle classes in particular see supplementary education as a way to stay ahead and get ahead. Lower classes may invest in it to try to become middle classes. Upper classes may not care very much. They've got other ways. They can buy their way into universities elsewhere. But the middle classes are where so much action is and the neoliberal marketplace provides plenty of suppliers. I will elaborate on that to say that each of those forces leads to expansion of supplementary education. Now, clearly, it's different in different places. In Vancouver, it's different from Seoul. In London, it's different from even Paris, and so on. There are differences in what we're looking at. And that's also part of the agenda that I would want us to elaborate more. But what we are seeing on the whole, we are seeing government reforms can have, commonly do have, unintended consequences of expansion of shadow education. So that Shanghai example that I have just given you. Progress in mass education also may lead to expansion of shadow education. Either like the Cambodian teachers who are earning extra salaries because they say their government salaries are not high enough, so schools' behavior forces students into shadow education, or simply teachers assuming that their students do get shadow education or supplementary education, and then themselves not taking the classroom work as seriously as they would otherwise. And thirdly, household investments clearly having an impact on this phenomenon. 
So, moving towards my conclusion, what am I saying here? Again, Noah, you told us about the promise for our field. So what are the implications? I think what I'm saying is, and again, thinking about my own career, I started looking very much at schooling. I'm still interested in schooling, and I'm still interested in planning. But I think that the environment for planning and the fact that IIEP spearheaded this work on shadow education is significant. IIP can be congratulated on that. It was before my time as director, so I congratulate and specifically a lady called Françoise Caillot, who is known to some of the people in the room, for taking it on. Planners need to look out of school as well as in school. They need to look at this phenomenon. So overall, we need stronger recognition that education is more than schooling. I'm not hearing it enough, including in UNESCO's GEM report, Global Education Monitoring Report, the section on financing is still dominated mostly about government budgets and foreign aid. It neglects household expenditures. And as you saw those figures from Korea, household expenditures can be huge. So we've got to have much stronger recognition. And my feeling is that as a research community, we are way behind reality. This has been going on for a long time while we have been working, focusing on other themes. We are behind the trajectory on this. The research community has not caught up with reality. We do need much more careful, much more thorough collection of data. The PISA people are working on it, but frankly, the 2015 questions are also problematic, which disappoints me. Uh, they are an improvement, but they've still got lots of problems. And anyway, it's not just PISA. We need multiple ways to collect data. We need more refined units for comparison. I've talked about the complexity of this, uh, complexity of one-to-one -one or small group or big company. We've got many units of comparison that need to be unpacked. And I think that then coming back to that diagram that I have just built up with you, we need to have expanded conceptualization and to understand more clearly what's going on. I think that our field is well designed to do that because it gives extra variables. We can juxtapose places like Greece and Egypt and Japan to see what's common and what's different. So towards the end of my presidential address, I want to thank CIS for giving me this opportunity to reflect on my own career trajectory. I think that it's not unique. All of us, once you reach my age group, <laughs> reflect on where we've been, and we see some things that go through our age group and some things that are different and have got different emphases. What I would personally like to see is much more focus on this theme, among others, and a great deal more sophistication. And in that vein, I do invite comments, questions, and co-constructions, either now, probably not now, yes? Uh, okay, I didn't leave many, but all right. Uh, hmm. So we do have time for comments and questions, and I, I'll run around the room. If any. If none, that's fine with me. Thank you. Um, my name is Mohammad Shirazul Islam. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, recently, I mean, what we have been experiencing, recently means for the last 10, 15 years, uh, government is, uh, has been taking some kind of bigger ownership than before. So if uh, grade 10 or grade 5 exam rate is going up, 
So government immediately takes the credit. Uh, education minister hands over the results to the prime minister. So that way, we are, I mean, government takes a much bigger stake. And no governments, be it in the US or in, in a poor country like Bangladesh, no government wants to look themselves back. So that creates a huge pressure on the government machinery, meaning the bureaucrats, the poor teachers who are part of that machinery to show a better performance. And so they are under pressure to perform better. So the way they develop all types of measuring tools is to show themselves good. And that pressure is multiplied <laughs> and, and goes upon the family and the children. And the poor family and the children, they do not have any other choice than supplementary education. So what would be your suggestion in that case? Suggestion is, this is going to be hard. Um, first, I recognize what you're talking about. Thank you for bringing the Bangladeshi story. One of our team members recently finished his own PhD thesis on shadow education in Bangladesh, and we heard a great deal about it. What I would say to all of us is that this stuff is not going to go away. Uh, there are various people who are saying, oh, let's eliminate shadow education, including the Minister of Education in Bangladesh has tried to, has talked about banning it. Uh, Minister Nahid has said, not yet, uh, but the implication is I'm going to do it. Uh, I personally have a particularly big problem with teachers tutoring their own students. And that, I think, is a policy domain where I would want to have focus. But my own view is that this phenomenon is growing and is not going to go away. And then we just have to work within the variables that we've got. Now, there's a lot more to say, and I would like to take that as a comment, and we can discuss that uh, separately. Noah? Let's take one more comment or question. Hi, my name is Sui Yong and I'm from Penn State. You know, I'm studying online the shadow education. I think I have two questions. Um, I couldn't agree more with your comment that, you know, there is huge limitation of a PISA um, in teams when it comes to measure of a shadow education. But at the same time, I'm curious about what's the best way to use existing data for the shadow education research. At the same time, I think my second question is, the, what's the best way to measure shadow education in international airport so that, that a lot of the researchers in shadow education move forward? The first question, what's the best way to use the data? The answer is carefully. <laughs> the second question, what's the best way to measure it? Equally, carefully. My view is, as with schooling and other aspects which are in the IEA studies and the PISA studies, they show us some things, they don't show us other things. And again, my overall view is that the agenda for supplementary education is, again, to some extent, a shadow of the agenda for schooling. We need to have much more focus on all the things that we look at for schooling, at curriculum, at uh, teaching styles, at pedagogy, at class size, and so many things. So I would say it's a big agenda for all of us. Those who like numbers get us better numbers. Those who like ethnographic work, there's a huge amount of work to be done ethnographically, and we add it together to get the total picture. So I think, unfortunately, we need to draw this to a close because we have our award ceremony coming after this, up after this. Uh, so please stay for that. That's an important moment for our society. Uh, I just want to add one more thing, is that those of us, most of us, all of us in the room who know Mark well, know that he typically travels with a satchel full of books. <laughs> That's true. And so I just want to let you know that downstairs in the exhibit hall, there's a Cirque table with a pile of books, which are not going back to Hong Kong, and I believe are available 
at half price. Or less. Or less. Wow. So <laughs> please join me in thanking Mark for a brilliant presidential. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And please stay for the award ceremony. We're going to take about five minutes to reset the stage, and then we'll get started with that.